Hey everyone, welcome to a virtual image out. And uh, my name is Michael Gamilla, and I'm the programming director. And just uh, yesterday, we announced our audience award winners and our jury award winners. And we are fortunate today to have uh, our documentary uh, award winners with us. So let me bring them on stage first. Uh, we'll have the co-writer and co-director of Cured, uh, Patrick Salmon, who uh, won our uh, Image Out Audience Award for 2020 for Best Documentary fe Feature. Congratulations, Patrick. Thank you very much. We appreciate the honor. It's good to be with you. Yeah, well, I, I'm just glad that you could be with us and talk about your movie. Um, yeah, it's been a long journey. I think we, my production partner, Bennett Singer, and I started more than five years ago. So it's exciting to share it with audiences and it's such an important story to tell. Yeah. Um, so we also have the theme from A Warm in the Heart. So we have writer and director, Paul Rice, and uh, his producer, uh, Leah Montgomery. Uh, and they I won the know. Image Out Jury Award for Best Documentary. Congratulations, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Like, honestly, we were just delighted to be part of um, Image Out Festival. So to win is like, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, guys. Thank you for especially all that you're doing throughout this pandemic to keep, uh, you know, the film festivals alive. I know it's uh, such a, a, a big effort. So we really appreciate you. So thank you. Well, thanks for making your movies, because without great movies to share with our audiences, you know, it. Uh, we won't we won't be happening anyway. So uh, I'm just glad that uh, we could bring your films uh, to to our audience here in Rochester. And thank God for well, we you know one of the few things that I'm thankful for with this virtual uh, reality that we're in now is uh, we theoretically have a wider reach because uh, right like Image Out is available to anyone in New York State. Uh, not just Rochester and our surrounding areas, uh, but hopefully uh, uh, many people uh, got to see your film. So um, just to start talking about the film, um, I know that, uh, you know, documentary is always a big effort. And uh, as far as filmmaking goes, uh, some of them take years and years to really complete your project. So I was just wondering, um, what started this journey for you? Uh, what what gave you idea to uh, uh, to work with the the different the subjects that you you guys uh, worked with on your on your film? So maybe we can start with Patrick. Yeah, well, I my first film was uh, about a code breaker about Alan Turing, who was the World War II a British code breaker who was gay and after the war was uh, terribly treated and ended up taking his own life because of the persecution he suffered for being gay. So I'm uh, interested in stories about LGBT history because I think they're often deleted or forgotten. And I had spent a number of years distributing the, the first film and was looking for another idea. A friend of mine here in Washington, DC had written a treatment, a film treatment about the life of Frank Kameny, who's an important LGBT rights pioneer from the 50s and 60s. And in the story is this dramatic moment which we show in Cured of Dr. Anonymous, the man in the mask, who was a closeted gay psychiatrist who testified in front of the American Psychiatric Association in 1972 about his experience as a gay psychiatrist. And so Curate explores the story of, of the battle to get the APA to remove homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. It's a David versus Goliath story about all the activists who challenged the APA. And it was a critical designation because as long as we were classified as being mentally ill, then business and government were going to use that as an excuse to discriminate. And I was sort of a bit familiar with the story when my friend put this, his, you know, gave me this film treatment, but it sparked an idea for my, for my next documentary. And so I immediately thought, wow, this would be an amazing story. There hadn't been a documentary done about it before. So that was probably in late 2014. And so I, you know, dived right into it and recruited my friend and now collaborator, Bennett Singer, who's a very talented filmmaker, to join me as, as co-director. And we did our first interview in the spring of 2015. And the more we examined the story, we just realized how central this moment was in the history of, in the history of our movement. So that was sort of the spark that became a long journey. 
uh, um, it's there's a lot in your film, and we're gonna uh, go back to it uh, in a little bit. But what about you, Paul and Liam? Well, um, I think the main thing that sparked um, like our desire to make this film, A Worm in the Heart, which you know details the the lives and the struggles of the LGBT plus community across Russia, is because you know where politically where we are in the West, things have gotten a lot better for us. You know, I'm from Ireland, and uh, in 2015 we voted for marriage equality, and it passed really well. Liam's from Wales in the UK, and had a similar story and we're at this time where things seem to be seem to be progressing in the west and yet it's getting a lot worse in russia and i think unfortunately the lgbt plus community has a horrible history of you know really losing our heroes those people that have stood up for our rights who have fought for us and we lose them to um, aids or assassinations or to just surges of violence and right now, what is happening in Russia, they are in the heart of their civil rights movement for LGBT equality. And we just wanted to go there and meet with these people that are really risking not just their, you know, their livelihoods, but their actual lives, putting everything on the line to be who they are and to also fight for greater equality in their country. So we just felt like we wanted to go there and meet with these people that um, are doing so much and putting so much on the line. and meet with people that are risking everything, but also just living there as well and living their day to day and just what it's like to really be, to be them. Yeah, and I think it was also <clears throat> really important for us to highlight the, the kind of excessive changes only happened for uh, queer people in the UK and America very recently. Um, and I think the intro to it is that we're not just kind of pointing the finger at Russia and being like, how can this happen? Because there are so many things like even listening to Patrick or, or watching Cured that have happened in our own history that have recently changed um, that really highlights um, our own accountability when it comes to those things. You know, we had Section 28 in the UK that was around until 2009. I believe, um, and you know, we're prohibited people uh, from talking about uh, homosexuality in schools or any public governing bodies. Um, so I think it was really important also to show that our kind of um, left-leaning heroes um, had very conflicting ideas on the way in which we could leave our, uh, live our lives um, before going over to to speak to the people of Russia who are experiencing far greater. Um, atrocities but you know still we wanted to bring that parallel to the viewer so it's something that is um relatable to everybody um i thought it's you know documentaries fascinate me in a way because i think making them is a very organic process uh, as opposed to making a feature film where you have this set script and things might change every now and then but I feel like for documentaries, you go with the flow of what's happening and uh, well, depending on, on what you're working on, like Patrick's uh, film is more historical. So, you know, you have your own, you can only work with so much, uh, but uh, warming the heart, uh, you're talking about uh, subjects in the present time and uh, over a period, so things might change. So uh, my, my next question, I guess, is, how did you structure your film? Uh, like for you, Patrick, there's so much materials on on uh, the APA and uh, the designation of uh, homosexuality as a, as a, as an illness. So, how did you go about approaching that big topic and all the materials and try to structure your your film? And with Paul and Liam, I'll go back to you after uh, Patrick's response to that. Yeah, one of the big challenges with this story is that it um, there was no one hero or or heroine. There was there was a group of people who came together and played di big parts at different moments. So from a filmmaking perspective, that made it really challenging to sort of you don't want to overwhelm the audience with too many too many voices, but at the same time each of the people we wanted to highlight had played essential parts in the story. And so we hoped that people would go along for the ride with us and sort of appreciate people were going to come and go. And we 
hoped that we hope that the drama of this effort to get the APA to change its its position on homosexuality would would keep people with us and and the number of of main characters wouldn't confuse people. But that was an, a a challenge we knew from the beginning. But we didn't want to cut certain people out just because it wasn't convenient as a filmmaker that there were a lot of people involved. We wanted to do justice to, to the main people. And I'm sure there are, there are a couple more people we, we could have included as well. But it, so that was the biggest challenge from the beginning. And we knew the sort of key points we wanted to hit. But of course, you can't be too devoted to that sort of beginning treatment or outline. You know the pieces you have to connect. But we have a great archival research team. Uh, Murdu Chandra and Luann Jones, our archival producers, did excellent work. Bennett and I visited 10 or 12 archives ourselves, and nothing can replace that those in-person visits. But then you sort of let the discoveries along the way determine the course of how you stitch it together. And one of the things we really set out to do was to try and find archival material of our main characters working for this kind of change to battle the APA back then. We have this key moment in 1971, a group of seven out lesbians appeared on the David Susskind show, which was a national talk show on PBS. And it was the first time that you know a group of out lesbians had been on national TV. And it's so empowering to see these activists challenge the conventional wisdom that we were mentally ill. And just being able to see Reverend Magora Kennedy, who's one of our, our main main characters in the film, seeing her back in that time and then contrasting her recollections today is, is I think, a really powerful way to tell the story. So that was something we were focused on from the beginning was to find those archival tidbits of, of our main characters so that we could marry that with the present day recollections. And I think that allowed us to bring, you know, today's voices into the, into the moment of this dramatic story. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the challenges for you is uh, you have you're, you're going to feature main characters that are no longer with us, so you have to really depend on on a good archival you know research team to come up with uh, the materials for you. And and um, I have to say though, when you when you when you talk about uh, Frank Kameny and the Barbara Giddings, uh, you know to uh, to uh, front people in the fight for for LGBT rights uh, back in the day, um, and because there are so many so many films already that were made about uh, the fight for LGBT rights, and they usually feature those two people. I was like, okay, what what would be something new that I would find in this? In this, you know, I'm sure it will because I see the same materials over and over again that are used on them, but. You mentioned that uh, the PBS show uh, with and Barbara Giddings was one of the guest lesbians, and I thought that was so fascinating and how relaxed she was on that seat and just throwing these questions and challenges to the host. I thought that was amazing, and I have not seen that, so that was that was great. Um, but um, yeah, and I I thought that was the main challenge for you. Uh, now going back to to Paul and and, and Liam, uh, I guess the challenge for you for what you wanted to do is finding the people that would talk to you uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know talk about your film. So I guess my question is, how did you go about um, finding these people? And I know you 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 did your research uh, beforehand, but when you collect their stories, does that mean that? Um, well, I'm, I'm thinking you won't have a, an idea of what kind of material you're going to get because you haven't talked to these people yet and you haven't been to these places that uh, you plan to. So in a way, when you're going there, it's like a work in progress for the lack of a better word. So I was wondering if you could talk about that experience. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of mentioned that documentaries often unfold in like a very, very organic way. And that's that was definitely the case with ours. And in some ways it was a bit of a leap into the dark. We didn't really truly know who we were gonna meet or what we would find when we went there, but we we wanted to get a great balance of um, LGBT plus leaders and activists, 
but also people that were just trying to live their lives and weren't necessarily out in public and were just dealing with with society at large in their own way. So we kind of approached it in a in a twofold kind of way. The, the first uh, thing we did was we reached out to the um, LGBT plus support centers across Russia, and obviously Russia is huge. So they span from Moscow and St. Petersburg in the west all the way out to Irkutsk in the, in the east above Mongolia. And we asked if they would like to join us on film, and um, we were lucky enough that many of them did. Um, and then once uh, we asked them if they had anyone in their social circles that would like to you know, speak to us on, on film and share their stories. And then from there, it got very interesting. Um, we added them on Facebook and VK, which is like Russia's Facebook. And it, uh, we started to scroll through their profiles, look at their friends and uh, look for people who we thought maybe would be LGBT plus. And we kind of started this weird kind of courting ritual where we had message people, uh, we had uh, go on voice messages with them and uh, a few Skypes to try and, try and set up uh, who we were and establish some trust because unfortunately there's a really horrific trend in Russia of kind of uh, gay catfishing by thugs who will uh, go on dating sites um, which are very private because again it's very difficult to be LGBT plus in Russia so they will go on LGBT plus uh, dating sites pose as a queer person and then once that uh, queer person goes out into the public to meet them they'll often be met with thugs who will beat them up or worse. So it was very, very difficult to get people to trust us. So we had to put in a lot of prep work uh, before we went there. Um, but then once we were on the ground and we really started connecting with the people that we met, um, I think people found it really helpful. And I think they really enjoyed talking with us and sharing their stories. And often when we were in a particular city, they would contact their friends and say, hey, we're with these two random queer people from Ireland and the UK. Um, we want to come by and and talk to them and, and share your story. So even when even though we established people that we're going to meet with, as we were on the ground, it continued to unfold. Um, so it's it a very kind of leap into the dark kind of situation. Um, but I think that was yeah. part of the whole journey, really. Yeah, there, there were a few occasions because, you know, one of the biggest things that we have is not just the language barrier, but the fact that the whole vocabulary is written in Cyrillic. So, you know, it's it's very difficult to communicate with people. And luckily, at, at first, me and Paul had a mutual friend, um, Hilary, who went to go and see Peter Tatchell speak in uh, London, um, just about a human rights talk. So she uh, got his email address, told him about the project that we were doing, and then he kind of sent us um, his contacts uh, for, for Russian people. Then we were, I think the first place was like LGBT Center in St. Petersburg, who gave us a bunch of contacts. But even within that, um, there was some people that were reaching out to us and Paul did a bit of research and found out that they were from like this Orthodox vigilante group. Um, so there's one thing about pre-arranging as best as you can, um, but there were certainly times where we were waiting in this very old industrial place in St. Petersburg for over an hour for uh, the, this one uh, translator that we were meeting and just looking around us thinking, oh my God, this could definitely be the, the, the uh, wrong decision to have made but um you know as paul said it did really happen very organically that the more people we met uh the safer you felt because it's a matter of survival for them to have their safety net in communities so once you're within that fold um you know it's it's something that's so essential for them to live their everyday lives so the fear falls away for you because you're just a visitor um in this world and you can really feel their strength and resilience in the moment. Um, so I think as the journey progressed, uh, our confidence in those peoples and, and those connections and the rainbow railroads, so to speak, um, just was really fortified. So, uh, and in regards to your question about the structuring of the documentary, I think me and Paul had it easy in one way because we were kind of on a very linear route, right? So we were going directly through uh, Russia and six different stops um, and it kind of really d it definitely built to the structure of the documentary because as Paul mentioned so many times in the movie you know St. Petersburg and Moscow are the kind of well-known 
uh, metropolitan areas. But as we moved further out on the train, and sometimes we would be on the train three days without stopping, um, you can really see the vastness and kind of loneliness and the breadth of the country as you're going further and further east. Um, so I, I think also doing it in midwinter, which was Paul's choice, not mine, because we were, <laughs> you know, freezing the entire time. But um, uh, yeah, it really kind of added to, to the ambiance of the of the film, and you know, um, the importance of what a community can do for really desperate people. That was I was going to ask because uh, uh, you know I. Like like you mentioned, the the trip on the train uh, you know, on the Trans Siberian Railway uh, is is almost part of the story. It is part of the story. Was that planned, um, or did that just happen? That well, we were taking this train anyway, so we might as well <laughs> a structure the film around it. No, that was that was very much an essential part of the film. Um, the Trans Siberian. I mean, as Liam just mentioned, Russia is vast. Um, it's historically very hard for people just to move about the country due to its sheer size. So the Trans-Siberian Railway has historically and still is a lifeline of the country. It's how people kind of get from one end of the country to the other. So it's a very living train line. And we wanted to have that play a really important role in the film. And, you know, as Liam mentioned, St. Petersburg and Moscow, they are the metropolitan cities that are very close to Europe. So that's kind of what the world sees Russia as these very big, beautiful cities that are conservative, but still somewhat European, but that's not truly what Russia is. And we used the train line to go across the entire country to meet with people in like really far flung towns and cities in the heart of Siberia, um, because that's would, in order to give us a true understanding of what the country was. Because I think being a queer person in Moscow, you'll have it tough, it'll be difficult. But you'll have it'll be a lot easier for you if you're living in Moscow than it will if you're living in uh, Tumen or Yekaterinburg in the heart of Siberia. So it was very much so a an essential part of the documentary. It kind of was a linear feature. It kind of helps guide you and us through the film, um, but it also played a very important role just connecting us to the people. Um. I think you know your your documentaries, uh, both films. In in my head, they couldn't be any more different from each other, uh, because you know one is historical and one is, um, you know, the present. But I feel like uh, um, deep deep in the hearts of your documentary, it's it's really about the fight for LGBTQ rights. So they're really very the same. It's just the materials are different. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to go back to Patrick because I feel like your timeline, we were talking about the time, the, the structure that they use is the, the Trans-Siberian Railway trip. Uh, but for you, I feel like it's the, uh, the timeline of all the events with the, with, with the, with the fight to get um, the homosexuality struck out of the, of the nomenclature uh, uh, diagnostics book. Um, and I, when I started watching your film, I felt like uh, this was before before I booked it, before I included it in the in the festival, it was just submitted, uh, um, you know, to the festival, and I was watching it, I'm like, well, I know what happened then. But I'm like, when I started watching it, oh, there are so many things I did not know about, you know, the whole process. And it's very difficult to uh, take for granted the fight that a lot of uh, uh, our LGBTQ uh, 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 activists from before, that uh, who we owe so much for bringing us to where we are now. So it's sometimes very diff uh, It's easy to take their uh, what they did for granted, but uh, your film kind of brought into focus uh, all these so many things that happen and there's so many things that happen and and like those activists said they were expecting the fight to last so much longer and you know within a little over a decade they were able to to do something substantial um and and great for the community so can you just talk about um i don't know if you if you want to talk about 
uh, all the things that happened, um, um, you know, just the process of, of, of how the, of how the, they were able to uh, get the homosexuality out of the, out of the book. Yeah. And one of the challenges, you know, as we, as we had to tell the story, we have to present, you know, some of the things who, some of the people who know a lot about LGBT history, as you were saying, a lot of the, the bits are familiar, but there's a whole lot that that's new. And this story hasn't been told in this way and in this depth. And so we couldn't take it for granted that the viewer already knew certain things because we wanted to make a film that someone who doesn't know anything about this history can, can tune in and watch it. And I think one of the things that we quickly realized as we started on this film is that even though it is about history, it's very relevant to the present. And it's about how, you know, this, this film really tells the story of how you create social change and how you, uh, you know, turn the energy of activism and, and use that to harness change. And I think hopefully people will get that message from the film and some big picture items. I mean, ultimately, the key to the success of this fight against the APA is you had the angry activists protesting, storming into APA meetings and disrupting what was going on. But then you had insiders like Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings. They were outsiders too. They participated in some of the protesters. But ultimately you needed the people with the knowledge inside who could maneuver through through to create the change. And in, in the story of our film, some of those people are psychiatrists, either gay psychiatrists or straight allies who wanted to bring about this change. And I think that's one thing today is that with any social change movement, you need both of those elements. You need people gathering in the streets, but you also need people maneuvering within within the halls of power. And ultimately that's what our, our film tells the story. I mean, it started with Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings in the, in the mid sixties participating in, in protests in Washington and Philadelphia. And then after Stonewall, a whole bunch of new activists join this fight and very quickly the APA becomes a focus of their first sort of big fight. And there was this tension between gay liberation activists and you know, assimilationists who just wanted to fit in. But on this issue, they were both working together because they understood the importance of, of getting this homosexuality removed from the APA uh, Manual of Mental Illnesses. So our film sort of chronicles the events, the mix of these insiders and outsiders, the reform efforts that were going on within the APA, and then the pressure that was happening from outside. And it was really those two working, I won't say hand in hand because it wasn't necessarily that well coordinated. You can see it when you look back on it, but in many ways they were working independently and a bit suspicious of the other, but it was their combined efforts that brought about this change. And I, and I think, uh, you know, you could make a film about that and it will, you know, not to be harsh, but it can it can sound very dry and boring because it would just be very factual. But I think for your film, you are able to uh, to have very interesting people uh, introduced to the vast majority of people now that may not be uh, aware of things from the past. Uh, and you, you, I, I was introduced to a lot of personalities that I did not even know about. Like I thought it was very interesting that uh, you had you featured that uh, the disruption of the APA meeting in 1970 and how it started out like a disruption but ended up being a dialogue between the psych the psychiatrists or the psychologists uh, with uh, various uh, uh, LGBTQ activists because that's what's missing from their work is the actual input from from the people that they're talking about and who are they designating as sick people. Uh, and then you have, uh, you mentioned earlier, Dr. John Pryor uh, in 1972 and wearing that uh, ridiculous looking mask. And, you know, even uh, Charles Silverstein, uh, you know, all the things that he did. So I feel like you, you could almost do separate films about those different people because of all the things that they've done. Uh, so, it was great to be educated, uh, not just about the the main subject of of your film, but also about these different personalities that we owe so much uh, 
do because of what we have now. So uh, did you learn anything uh, while making your film? Yeah, a lot of what we learned ended up on the film. I mean, there, we sort of knew the, the, the big picture of this story, but it was really as we started talking to the people who participated, we learned so much more. And I think you hit on one point, and thank you for the kind words about the film. I really appreciate that. This, the, the activists have this phrase they always use, we are the experts on our lives. And that was a mantra that they kept focusing on when they talked to psychiatrists and had these protests, because for so long, psychiatry had ignored actual real gay and lesbian people. They sort of had these theories and they would be relying on their, their own, quote, expertise to make generalizations, but they weren't actually talking to members of our community and finding out about their lives. So that was really a, a focus that, that the activists wanted to be the experts on their lives rather than relying on the sort of psychiatrist to determine what they were like and, and who they were. So that was um, an interesting piece. One of the most surprising things we learned is the impact that this label, this mental illness label, had on the psyche of, of gay and lesbian people. It was, they really believed they were mentally ill. And it's understandable if you're, you know, if you're 15 years old and you go to a library, your high school library in 1967, trying to figure out who are you. And, and the first thing you come across are three books that say you're sick and you're mentally uh, you know, you're you're psychotic and there's something wrong with you. It has such a huge impact. And even the activists like Ron Gold, who's one of the characters in our film, he's a gay liberation activist. And even in the early 70s, he felt less about himself. You know, it's this notion of internalized homophobia, which of course is still a, a thing, you know, it's, it's still something you know, our community deals with. And, and so that was an important um, piece of the equation to understand to be able to change this classification had such an impact on the people, uh, you know, coming later. I remember a couple of the people, friends of mine who uh, I've told during the production process, and they remember hearing this news on the radio. They were 15 or 16 at the time, but they knew even back in 1973 that this was significant and it was going to affect their lives. And it really laid the groundwork for more activists to join the fight. And and engage in the the very difficult struggle that that went on and still is going on and and still the trying to create the kind of equal a world for for LGBTQ people. Well, your your team did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> and just to segue to uh, to a warm in the heart of the importance of of finding the right people to talk to and featuring them in your in your um, in your documentary. Um, I thought you, you guys did a good job in uh, putting together interesting people as well, because it's um, um, it's easy to just it's easy to just bring together all these victims and tell their sad stories, but you 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 put a a great mix of uh, um, activists and people who are hopeful. Uh, but also people who have suffered through a lot. And, but I thought the, the one that was interesting, uh, um, the one interesting part is when you got to, uh, to the Siberian areas and um, uh, you started talking to the travesty artists, uh, which for us is like drag queens. And I thought I was a little, um, I wasn't sure what was going on because I feel like they, they seem to live freely uh, as drag performers or as artists. Uh, is that allowed in Russia because it's considered your craft and you can perform in clubs and in full drag and it's okay, as opposed to you know just being a regular gay guy um, and then you're getting attacked. Uh, but also I was struck by that one um, person that you you featured who is more like he's just happy to keep his head down and you know I, I think his words was like you have to look around and see where you are before you scream uh and he doesn't he doesn't really advocate for people screaming out loud and saying who they are and asking for for the rights so i was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit um 
Yeah. yeah, I think um, kind of going on Patrick's point a little bit, there is a lot of internalized homophobia. Um, and also Russia is really a patriarchy in the kind of hugest sense of the word. So, um, you know, one thing with what it is to be a man in Russia is this kind of ultra masculinity. And one thing that they do have a privilege of doing a lot of the time is assimilating. Um, so there would be people that could, you know, go and hook up with someone, but then go back and live their everyday match with self and, you know, their sexuality or queerness would be in inconsequential to them. And I think it's kind of a, a survival mechanism for a lot of people, um, because you're talking about the travesty artist. Well, the travesty um, artist does exist, but it's mainly for um, a straight audience. So people go uh, for kind of a show on a Friday night to see these drag performers, but we you know it's drag performers, but it's called travesty artists. And I think it's because it, it is slightly outrageous that it does make for almost kind of like a good dinner sort of freak show type scenario, but it's mainly for straight audiences, which is how it can exist. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, the travesty art artist that we interviewed has found a way to kind of um, to kind of assimilate the best way that he can. Um, so yeah, Paul, I'm sure you've got a lot more to say on that. No, I, I think you you know you, you really touched upon it there. I think there are in many countries there's one world for the wealthy and there's one world for the regular people. And a lot of these travesty artists they perform for wealthy straight audiences, as Liam said, um, behind closed doors, and it's seen as like this ludicrous display. Um, but due to the prop gay propaganda law, you can't have any display of homosexuality or you know otherness, shall we say, in the public realm. So the fact that if you have enough money, you can go and watch this travesty or drag show is kind of like this this other world for a lot of people in Russia if you have the money. And what Liam said um, a minute ago about this inner homophobia was really evident um, in that travesty performer, Evgeny, um, that you that you mentioned. And I think, you know, as, as queer people, we've all experienced this. Sometimes it's too difficult and it's too painful to really recognize just how bad your life or a situation around you truly is. So you keep your head down and you keep performing and go, no, everything's fine. Um, you know, the world may be homophobic and that's fine. I'll learn how to live within that instead of trying to change it because it's too difficult and it's too painful to truly acknowledge it. Um, and Evgeny was a really great performer. He's a really powerful, strong performer. He's really, really talented. Um, and he gets paid a lot of money to do what he does. And I think part of getting paid that much is you have to choose to live in a slightly different world where you really are living truly behind closed doors. Um, the idea of Evgeny or any travesty artist or you know drag performer performing out in public in the streets in Russia would absolutely result in jail time and fines and like a lot of violence. So sometimes it is just easier to keep your head down and pretend that everything's fine. And also, so I, I, I guess with Evgeny, it's a oh sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think it's one of those things that can be a, a trait across the board, depending on where you are and when, where you get back. Right? It's a way of kind of separating yourself from the other. So it's more of, I am one of them, but I'm not that. Do you know what I mean? Which is ridiculous, because as we're interviewing him, he's applying his full face of makeup, ready to perform, you know, Diana Ross song. But it's also something that's very essential to a lot of people and part of their coming out stories, you know, they, there's acceptance and then there's real acceptance. And I think um, that all derives from a, a, a large part of fear. And in this case, for someone, uh, you know, who's very far away from uh, even the metropolitan capital of Russia, um, it's something that has been essential for him to probably be the professional that he is. and you know, create relationships that are safe because even though he's other, he's not that. Um, and I think even on a psychological tool, um, that's something that he's very, very much used to become the success that he is. So, um, and he's not asking yeah, for change. So, you know, all of them are various uh, degrees of survival skills that have 
enabled them to adapt around their environment. And yes, no. So Sorry. I. Oh, well, bye, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he has a bad connection, but I was I was also just gonna uh, ask you the same thing because, um, you know, it's it's wildly different uh, researching for all these people you want to talk to before your trip, and uh, having some expectations. And I imagine when you were there and and actually were uh, immersed in the situation and talking to these people, it's a totally different experience. So. Uh, I guess the same question that I asked Patrick, what did you learn about uh, your experience in talking to these people and, and uh, trying to get materials for your film? And is there a, a favorite personality or person that you spoke to uh, during the trip that really struck you and uh, gave you a lot to think about? Yeah, I think we, were, we learned quite a few things. And um, I think one of the, the first things that really struck us immediately was just how naive we were. Um, I think we wanted to um, meet with these people and, and share their stories with a Western audience, but also paint a, a picture of hope for them, for, for these people that we were meeting. You know, we, we often started with saying, you know, I'm from Ireland. Ireland was a very conservative Catholic country. The idea of, of gay marriage um, or same-sex marriage being legalized by a popular vote in Ireland would be hysterical a few years ago, but look where we are. Maybe this will happen for you in Russia. And I think very quickly we realized that we were living, we were in different worlds and we were incredibly naive to put a Western model onto Russia and think, you know, if you follow these steps, A, B, C, you'll be on the right road and you'll have same-sex marriage soon. Russia is um, it's on its own path. And I think the queer community there um, has to use and is using its own traditions the um, and its own kind of way of going about bringing um, better equality for its citizens there. So our naivety really shone through right away and we kind of adapted with that. And we kind of share that narrative in the film as well. And I think it's important to, to kind of have that um, viewpoint in the film because I think a lot of Western um, audiences might kind of think the same thing. You know, it was bad here, but you know, if it's bad in Russia, give it a few years, keep fighting and, and you'll get there. So I think it's important to kind of sh to show how different of a world Russia really is in. Um, and the other thing we learned very quickly is just how tough Russians are. Um, everyone we met with has got, you know, they went through really, really difficult, really awful um, situations, attacks from their families, from their friends, uh, being fired, near-death experiences, catfishing. And yet they were very tough, very resilient. They had a great sense of humor often about, the th about what was going on. And I think, you know, part of that, you know, is that they are true patriots as well. They do love Russia, even though society is actively kind of fighting against them they want to make it better they want their country to be better because they love their country and i think that also gives them strength as well um so i think those are two things that we very quickly learned and i think no one embodies that strength more than yal um and yal was and is i should say um we fe we met with her in moscow and she was the first person um, to ever set up a trans support group in Russia after the fall of the USSR. She translated hundreds of um, medical documents into Russian for the first time, uh, because of course during the USSR, a lot of this information about um, transitioning and just the trans identity was not available. And so she was really responsible for bringing a lot of the information to the forefront in Russia. She is a huge pillar of support for the trans community in Russia. And she is just, so tough, so loving, really funny. And um, it was really inspiring to be around someone who was that smart. And everyone around her, you could just see how much they relied on her, how much they depended on her for strength, for guidance. And she just shrugged it off, kept going. And um, I think she was and is a really inspirational person. I think she's someone who we've stayed in constant um, contact with, um, not just because she's smart and um, 
a real hero because she's really funny as well. And she's just been like a, a true friend that we've met along the way. I think the, the good, uh, the, one of the best things about your film is uh, it gives uh, people, in, uh, people in the West the, uh, a window to how the other half lives. And mm. we always take things for granted here. And we, we just assume that it's the same for everyone else when it's not. I mean, a lot of, it's a, str uh, it's a lot more struggle for a lot more people that is not in, in, in the Western world. So um, going back to, to Patrick, um, you know, I know that you highlighted that win for us to get the, the uh, homosexuality uh, out of the, the list of sickness of, or mental disorders. Uh, and it's just one win. And in your uh, in in the credits uh, of your film, you started to like pop up all these uh, little victories that the LGBT community um, um, had uh, over the years. So that was interesting, and it was not easy to catch all of them. Uh, but I guess my question is, uh, what what do you think? Uh, what what is your opinion on what's going on right now in the? Um, I don't know if it's, I should ask this question because it's political. But I, what's what is your opinion on what's going on in the the nomination of the uh, for the new justice for the Supreme Court? Because I feel like that will affect a lot of uh, LGBTQ rights potentially, uh, or even things that are already uh, in existence that were given to us might be taken away. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on, on the matter. Well, I'll let well, sort of legal experts who know a lot more about the court weigh in on, on sort of the details, but all I know is we need to keep fighting. The fight's not over and we can't sit back and, and take it for granted just because there was a, you know, a, a favorable Supreme Court decision at X, Y, or Z, or there was a legislative victory. I think the key to our success as a movement throughout history is sharing our stories and um, coming out to those we love and becoming um, involved and articulating why we deserve equal treatment. And that needs to continue no matter who's on the court. And that, you know, you've seen, I saw a poll of, I'm generally an optimist. I saw a very encouraging poll last week where Nash nationwide support for marriage equality is uh, now uh, up to 70% in the US. It's just unimaginable to, to me to, to think about the incredible progress that's been made. And so I think we need to keep fighting and we need to articulate why it is, you know, we need to include everyone. I know the fight isn't done here in the US. There are you know, trans people who are being murdered. There are people being treated badly and face discrimination. and LGBT people all across the country. And I used to spend several years living in uh, Northeast Tennessee. And Northeast Tennessee is in New York or San Francisco or Washington, D.C. And, and there are a lot of there's a lot of work still to do around this country locally. And of course, around the world, the important uh, film that, you know, Paul and his team have made is shows the work that has to be done globally. So I guess I'm generally an optimist, but I also understand that we can't sit back and assume that the rights we have today will be here tomorrow. We need to keep fighting. I think uh, you, you, the word progress is such a complicated term for me because progress isn't something you achieve. Uh, it's something that you have to keep working on because otherwise, you know, the other word for progress is regress, you know, so you can't go back. You Just because uh, you move forward uh, doesn't mean that you stop. You just have to keep fighting and, and moving forward. So I, I like that message that you, you have to keep fighting. Uh, for Paul, um, you, uh, towards the end of your film, uh, you, uh, you, you started talking about Chechnya and, uh, and there was a film uh, that was also released uh, earlier this year, Welcome to Chechnya, which, I think part of it you featured in the, uh, the press conference you featured in your film. Um, so it seems like for a lot of the, the LGBTQ people in, in the Russian Republic, um, uh, the, the solution is, I, I know that some people want to work with the society that they're in, but for a lot of them, uh, the best solutions is to get out. 
and maybe fight the system from outside. Um, so I guess yeah. Yeah. Um, how can how can people from the West or from the outside help? Uh, I guess who's who's left there, and I think you kind of you kind of talked about that towards the end of your film. Yeah, I, I think, um, and unfortunately, this is a trend that ha that has been going on in Russia for a long time, and I'm sure in, in in many other countries that I think a lot of Russian activists, LGBT plus activists, they fight for for greater rights, and I think part of what they do is they act as a, a refuge of support for younger LGBT plus people who perhaps then can carry the torch on after um, it gets too dangerous and people have to leave. That happened with Yal. Yal uh, was kind of the last of her generation of LGBT plus activists still in Russia. Unfortunately, as you see in the film, her and her husband had to seek asylum in New York um, because it just got too dangerous and their lives were very much so on the line. But she had stayed for so long and acted as a support and figure of strength that she inspired a new generation of activists to come up and fight. And I think that's one thing that also gives me hope is that, yes, sometimes it gets too dangerous, too tough, and people just have to leave for the sake of their safety. But just their acts of um, their courageous acts of when they did live there inspires a new generation to continuously push forward and keep fighting. And I think that's what gives me hope that there will always be someone there that will push forward and push for greater rights. And I think in regards to Chechnya, you know, Chechnya is it's a part of Russia that is uniquely or very intensely going through a, a gay purge, as their leaders would put it. Um, and it's really difficult. And I think the best way to support um, in the West is to continuously, even if it takes effort, is to continuously show up for them at protests, Russian flags, um, ask your leaders, um, even on a local level, to push for um, better relations with Russia, and also just donations. You know, a lot of, it's a real uphill battle in Russia. They have another law which um, basically bars any charities from accepting um, donations from abroad because they'll be seen as acting as a foreign agent. If they receive money from abroad, that is a foreign influence influencing Russia. So oftentimes the Russian government will stamp that out. So um, it's very difficult, but there is a charity, the LGBT network, which has registered itself as a quote unquote foreign agent. And although it, um, it's very intense for them uh, for the, with the Russian government. Um, they go through their financial books, um, which is very difficult for them, but they are able to accept donations. So I would encourage people, if they're able, to donate um, to the LGBT network in Russia. And there's a, a link at the end of our film, and there's a link on our website um, for people to kind of go to and donate directly to. I think that is really helpful. It keeps people in jobs um, and they keep fighting for more legislative wins in Russia. Well, I want to keep my promises in not going <laughs> over an hour. I feel like we can talk forever on, on the, the many things that you guys touch on on your films. And I'm so glad that you made your films. And, uh, and the good thing about that is they could start conversations so they're not just films that you watch and oh it's nice and then you move you move along i think uh, both of your films uh, would start conversation and hopefully inspire people to act uh, and do more and if not you know at least remember what others you know, had to fight for uh, and not take things for granted uh, you know what we have now so um, yeah. And I'm glad that my audience appreciated uh, the films. Uh, you know, Patrick won for Cured, and then you know, and and then um, a warm in the heart won, won our jury prize. So congratulations again, and we're so proud that you your your films are, you know, forever attached to our festival as winners. So um, right. so thank you. Uh, are, are there any last words that you might want to say to the audience uh, before we end? Well, if people want to follow, uh, curedocumentary.com has more details about our distribution efforts. We're in a bunch of other film festivals this fall. Uh, we're hoping to have a virtual theatrical run next spring, leading up to a national PBS broadcast in October of 2021. 
on independent lens. So we're excited to be able to share this story nationally. And then we have a London distributor that's trying to sell the film all around the world. So hopefully as many people as possible will be able to see and in, be inspired by these brave uh, activists who step forward and change the world. That's great. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of touched on it just a minute ago, but if people would visit our website, a worm in the .com, there'll be a link for people to donate to the LGBT network in Russia, which will genuinely um, help the situation in Russia. And I can only encourage people if they can to do that. And um, just thank you. Thank you so much for including us in the festival. Thank you so much um, for our win. It means, it means so much to us, but also to everyone that was featured in the documentary. Um, we met a lot of people along the way and we're st still in touch with almost all of them. So this win, it galvanizes them in Russia that people truly do care about them and their stories and makes them feel less alone. So thank you so much from me and Liam and thank you so much from them as well. Well, again, thanks for being with us um, here at Image Out and at the last minute. So I apologize for that, but I'm glad that we had this conversation. So, um, and good luck with uh, with the films. Uh, like, you know, my wish is for everyone to see it and more and more people see it and be inspired by it. And uh, so hopefully we'll hear back from you about uh, next projects and all that. And, and hopefully you'll be back at Image Out. So thank, thank you, you so again. much. And thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye-bye.